Well, good morning. This is the Lou Rockwell Show, and what an honor to have as our guest this morning, Judge Andrew P. Napolitano. Judge Napolitano is the senior judicial analyst for Fox News. He's the host of the wonderful Freedom Watch on Fox Business. He's the Ciceronian orator and the Jeffersonian writer, who is such a great champion of freedom in this country. And Judge, you've had five other important books. Nation of Sheep is my own particular favorite, but they're all great. But uh, why do I think that your latest book is the most urgent, the most timely, maybe the most important you've ever written? It's called, It is Dangerous to be Right When the Government is Wrong, The Case for Personal Freedom. Well, let me start, Lou, by telling you how much I, I love our professional relationship, and I deeply appreciate the generosity that you've shown toward me in this introduction uh, and in many others. All of my books have had the common theme that our rights come from our humanity, whether you believe we are the product of natural selection or, or the willful uh, image and likeness of an almighty. Uh, our freedom is integral to our humanity. That's not just an academic argument, because if freedom comes from our humanity, and then the government can't take freedom away from us unless it can demonstrate to a neutral jury that we've violated someone else's freedom. The themes are common among the books. The reason this is the most important is because the government keeps giving people like you and me and many of the folks listening to us now more material to worry about, and, and for those of us who write, more material to write about. As bad as George Bush was with respect to the Constitution and the dollar, Barack Obama is worse. Hard to believe, and I never thought I would be saying that, but almost every violation of Economics 101 or principle of natural law or guarantee in the Constitution that George W. Bush committed, Barack Obama has committed to a higher and more more offensive degree. It is more and more important today than at any time in our history that average members of the public, not, not lawyers and not legal scholars and not journalists that watch this stuff for a living, but the folks who work hard to put money on the table and raise their children and pay their mortgage, understand that our rights are ours and that any person in whose hands we have reposed the Constitution who supports or votes for legislation or executive action that takes our rights away from us is not worthy of that trust and needs to be voted out of office. Judge, has Obama just abolished the Fifth Amendment, for example? Well, it, it would seem so. I mean, the Fifth Amendment could not be clearer where it says that no person, not no American, no person, shall be subject to the laws of life, liberty, or property without due process of law. In, in the case to which you refer, I think, the, the murder of Anwar al-Awlaki, it's an easier case to make because he's an American. But the president set himself up as judge, jury, and executioner by, for the first time since the Civil War, dispatching the military to kill an American. We don't know the evidence that they had against him. We don't know how he got on the list. We don't even know the legal justification that the president used because he won't share that with us. And the creepier part is that the president's folks have leaked that there were 20 other names on that list. Well, who are they? How much more killing is going to happen before the Congress realizes that when the president uses the power of the government to kill when he does so in a manner that violates the Constitution, that's an impeachable offense. I noticed, too, that they sent in a predator drone to kill al 16-year-old son and some other teenage friends who were having dinner together because they felt that he might be a potential terrorist, too. So I guess they can just kill anybody for pre-crime. It's hard to believe that, that this is happening right before our eyes and, and in the present age, but it is. And the next generation of predator drones, as you may know, will be about the size of hummingbirds. So people will suddenly find that the table at which they're sitting or the vehicle uh, in which they're riding or the bed in which they're sleeping has been pulverized by something that they never saw uh, coming at the command of some faceless bureaucrat in Langley, Virginia, at the instruction of a president who's violating his oath to uphold the Constitution, who's violating the Constitution, who's violating uh, federal law, and who's committing murder. Judge, you reach millions of people in your writing and your, your your television work. So we know that a lot of people, and of course Ron Paul, whom you dedicate this book, I think very appropriately, reaches millions too. But outside of our circles, so to speak, writ large, is the average American just okay with this? I mean, what goes on at the airports and all the rest of it, do they worry about this the fact this is, is all, probably already a police state? I think that there is uh, more worry out there than we recognize but not enough worry to cause 
to generate the political change to make this stop. Most people couldn't care less about their privacy. Uh, I think they'd like not to have a camera on them when they're engaging in the private bodily functions that we all engage in. But the attitude seems to be, I didn't do anything wrong. I don't have anything to hide. That attitude, of course, will bring us East Germany, where there was no privacy and where the most frequently prosecuted crime was not murder, rape, robbery, or even espionage or treason. It was failure to report someone else's crime. So all of that stuff is coming. The government is watching us not only because it wants to know what we're doing, it wants to know what we're not doing. And we have begun to see, under the radar screen, prosecutors creatively, because there are no statutes that oblige you to report what you see, but creatively prosecuting people for the failure to tell the police what they saw. When the public begins to feel the sting of these prosecutions, it will then rise up. But by then, it might be very late and very difficult to rise up because the state will have perfected its means of watching everything we do. We know, for example, that if your cell phone is in your pocket and it's turned on, the government can follow you just by the signal sent out by the cell phone. And some cell phones, even when they're turned off, the government can follow you. The only way to prevent the government from using your cell phone to follow you is to disable it by taking the battery out. And, of course, the government never seeks search warrants for this. In fact, the government has argued to the Supreme Court, we'll get the decision uh, around Christmas time, that it doesn't need search warrants when it uh, follows us because it's following us for our own safety. Same argument that all the great monsters and dictators of the 20th century made. And don't they claim the right to go onto your property to put a device on your car follow you yes there there are people who are who don't have cell phones with them or cell phones in their cars and so the government has solved uh, that issue by literally walking into your driveway or your garage and putting a gps tracking device in your automobile and the government argued this is the obama administration this is the former professor of constitutional law this is <laughs> hope and change and transparency said to the court well we can do that because we don't have time to go get search warrants again an argument of a monster and a dictator i noticed that apparently there's some sort of secret court if i can use that uh, that word for it uh, that obama says well he's in holder they're not really making these decisions themselves about who to kill it's the secret panel of whomever but does this indicate that there may be really an entire structure of secret courts in this country well i hope not the only secret court of which we know is the fisa court f i s a foreign intelligence surveillance act actually does set up a court that does meet uh, in the Justice Department and for which uh, or the Justice Department keeps records and in front of which only one side appears. That's the Justice Department. Theoretically, all this court does uh, is issue uh, search warrants. Interestingly, they do issue well in excess of 99.9% .9 of all the requested search <laughs> warrants, so there's not very much scrutiny going on there. But yes, Lou, there, there was, at the time the government leaked the fact that there are 20 other Americans on the president's list, it also leaked the fact that the president consulted some people, and they were described as present and former government officials, judiciary and non-judiciary. So there is some unofficial, unauthorized by the statutes group that the president is conferring with when he decides on the lawfulness and the morality of his killing. Who will he kill next? I mean, what standards is he, is he going to use? I can remember debating this about 10 years ago here at Fox, and it was considered a hypothetical, considered a joke, it was considered fanciful that any president would actually do this, and now it's happening right before our eyes. And of course, the very word terrorist has an extremely elastic definition. I mean, we know that some people in the Department of Homeland Security consider you at least a terrorist suspect if you talk about the Constitution too much. Exactly. Have, have you seen any of these metallic copies of the Bill of Rights that a lot of our colleagues are carrying in their pockets because it sets off the alarms when you go through the TSA. And then when you empty your pocket and show the TSA <laughs> agent what it is, it's the Bill of Rights and the Fourth Amendment is in red. They really can't. <laughs> they really can't miss it. I'm not suggesting that people do this because it may cause the people behind them to miss their planes, but it's nice to confront the TSA with the Constitution they swore to uphold while they're in the act of violating it. <laughs> Judge. You know, you mentioned the Civil War. Lincoln actually had people, or the Lincoln regime, had people arrested for uh, hearing the president's policies criticized and failing to defend them. 
I think similar things happened under Wilson, probably under Roosevelt as well. In fact, John T. Flynn in his great book on American fascism, as we go marching, published in 1944, defines a totalitarian government as one which believes there are no restrictions on its powers. It may not be doing everything, but it has the right to do anything it feels necessary in the national good or whatever they would claim. So by that definition, anyway, is America today a totalitarian state? Unfortunately, it is. Just a few years ago, during the debate over Obamacare, I was interrogating uh, Jim Clyburn, a congressman from South Carolina, a liberal Democrat, who was, and I think still is, the number three ranking Democrat in the House. And I basically said, where in the Constitution is the federal government authorized to regulate health care? And he said to me, Judge, most of what we do in Washington is not authorized by the Constitution. <laughs> now, I commend him for his candor. But that's where the government is today. It doesn't recognize the Constitution. It doesn't recognize the natural law. It doesn't recognize the laws that is written. The only limits on its behavior, its willingness to destroy freedom and property, its ability to tax and regulate, is whatever it can get away with politically. That's the only limit it recognizes. Because the one thing the government wants as much as power is to stay in power. And they certainly believe that uh, there are no rights or rather any, any right, quote-unquote, that an American has or anybody else in the world is granted by them and can be taken away by them. The theory is called positivism, just a word that lawyers and philosophers have used uh, to summarize the views of those who think that rights come from the government, not from God, not from our humanity, but from the government. So to the government, it's perfectly logical for them to say, we give you this right, we can restrict the right in bad times, and if you behave the way we want you to, we'll let you exercise the right in good times. That would be a classic definition of a totalitarian government. Like many, many people in this country, I can't thank you enough for all you do for the cause of freedom, and thanks as well for this unbelievably great new book, It Is Dangerous to Be Right When the Government Is Wrong, The Case for Personal Freedom. By the way, the judge is as eloquent a writer as he is a speaker. This book goes very fast. It's inspiring. You will learn a tremendous amount from it. It'll help show you exactly where we are and what we need to do. So uh, we'll, of course, link to this, link to your other books, your Facebook page, Twitter, your website. All I can say is you inspire us all and keep doing it. And you, my friend, are the gold standard in defense of human freedom, and uh, I'm thrilled to be associated with you. And thanks very much for your time, Lou. Thank you, Judge. Well, thanks so much for listening to The Lou Rockwell Show today. Take a look at all the podcasts. There have been hundreds of them. There's a link on the upper right-hand corner of the LRC front page. Thank you. Thank you.